let's start the uh, uh, second morning session. And uh, this, uh, we start by two PhD student presentations, work by uh, <coughs> students of the uh, Milan of Design, start jointly with uh, Jonathan Levinstein. And the first is uh, Lee, right? Go ahead. OK, uh, thank you very much. So uh, as a I said, I'm a student of uh, Mirav Hissar and uh, Jonathan Levinstein, and together with Sagi, in the next talk, we'll be talking about the computational framework for perception and dyslexia. I'll, be, I'll present the basic findings and the model, and Sagi will add in the dyslexia part later. So I, I want to begin with a very general statement that perception is not purely bottom-up, even though that, that's mostly the way that we teach it in our textbooks and, and still viewed by many people as bottom-up, but, it, but, it, but it's really not. And to make sure that you're all with me on this statement, I want to um, start with two demonstrations. So I, I'm going to play a stimulus, listen carefully, and try to understand what it is. Okay, ra raise your hand if you understand what this is. Uh, let's try it again. Okay, anyone? Thank you. Uh, maybe. So now let's listen to something else. The man's painting a sign. And now the same stimulus again. The man's painting a sign. Okay. Did, did, did you hear? Did you perceive anything differently? Yeah. Pro probably you did. So uh, another demonstration. I'm going to play a short sequence of tones, th then a short pause, and then two more tones. L listen to, to the two less tones and try to, s try to tell which of the, of the last two was higher. Okay, so we'll listen, we'll hear it a few times. Okay, wh which one was higher? Let's listen to it again. Who, who thinks it, it was the last? Who thinks it was one before the last? Okay, majority. Now let's listen to another stimulus, the same pattern. Okay, who thinks it was the last? Most of you. Okay, so it, it sounds very different, right? The, the last two tones. But actually, f physically, they were the same two tones. Okay, the, the, the last two tones were identical between stimulus one and stimulus two. It's just the, the preceding um, series of, of tones made you perceive something uh, different in the two tones. Um, so, uh, uh, and you can find more, uh, th these are actually shepherd tones, so the, the right answer is not really well defined. You can read more about them in this reference. Um, so how, how do we study these, these kind of effect effects in the lab? We ask people to, to come and we play, uh, we give them two tones and ask them which one was higher. And it looks something like this, and then the subject answers and they get uh, feedback. Okay, the last one was more difficult. Actually, the, the, in our real experiments, the tones are even shorter than what you heard now, so it's even a little bit more difficult. And th th this uh, task has been studied for a while, and it's traditionally believed to measure just the sensory limits of the system. Why? Because we, we are giving the subject everything that, that he needs in order to make the comparison, in order to, to make a decision in, in the trial. He has to... Unlike like, uh, categorization experiments or detection, it's not about comparing an external stimulus to your um, uh, internal criteria or to your categories. Y you have two tones, you just have to compare between them. So if you make a mistake, it's probably because you did not perceive them accurately enough. And I'm, I'm going to try to claim that it's not exactly, um, it's not exactly true. And because of that view, Performance in, the, in this task is usually quantified using the, the J and D, or just noticeable difference. That's basically how different do the two stimuli have to be to achieve a certain level, like 80% correct discrimination. Um, so I, I, I've, I've um, <coughs> done a few of these experiments in the lab, but uh, for some reason decided not to, to do what the psychophysics handbook told me to, and not, not to just measure the JND, but to present the results in this way. So basically, the, the x-axis represents F1. That's the frequency of the first tone in the pair. The y-axis presents uh, F2, the, the frequency of the second tone in the pair. And every dot in this figure is one trial performed by one subject with um, uh, tens of thousands of trials in this figure. Um, and if the classical 
psychophysical prediction uh, was true, what we would expect is to see many mistakes along the diagonal, and further away from the diagonal, the further away we get, less and less mistakes, but movement along this axis should not make um, any difference at all. Uh, however, that's not what we find. Here, I colored all the trials in which the subjects responded correctly in blue, and all the trials in which they responded incorrectly in red, and the numbers <laughs> give you the, the average percent correct in each region. And, and, and in this figure, you see uh, the same data just binned and colored, co color coded according to the percent correctly in every bean. And what we can see is that there's a, an interesting pattern here. Okay, the, there are trials which are at, at the same distance from the diagonal, so they have the same physical difficulty, the same physical difference between the tones, but performance differs um, by a lot. Uh, uh, how, and just how much is a lot? So it, um, if we measure the JND of subjects using this data, we get a median JND of 11%. Now, if we measure the JND just using the trials from these two regions, the regions that seem that performance seems better, and we call them bias plus regions, uh, it will be clearer why um, in, in a few minutes. So we, we get a median JND of 4%. And if we measure the JND, so it, it's the same data, we just ignore, for each subject, we, we take only the trials from, from uh, these regions, and then we measure the JND, we get a JND of 27%. So for the same subjects, we have to, to make the, the stimuli six times more different to get the same level of performance. So it's a, it's a really large effect. And now we ask ourselves, why? Why, why would there be such a bias? Where, where could it come from? And so Im Im imagine that you are a subject in, in this task, and um, you hear F1, and then th there's a, um, this, the, the inter-stimulus interval, and then you hear F2. And then you have to compare them. Now, but by the time you hear F2, F, uh, you had to encode F1 into memory, retain it in memory, and then uh, retrieve it from memory. And then w when you make the comparison, they're not really symmetrical, right? F2 is right there, but F1 is maybe has some um, degraded representation. Now, let's start with the extreme case. Let's say that um, you don't remember F1 at all by the time you hear F2 and have to make a decision. So what can you do uh, better than guessing? So if you know the distribution of, of, um, of the stimuli in the experiment, let's say that you know that F2 was 1,400. So in, in, in this distribution, you know for certain that it was the higher tone, right? Because all the trials in which F2 equals 1,400 are above the diagonal. So the correct answer must be um, that F2 is higher, even though you don't remember F1. You can still uh, get the answer right. So e even in, in um, less extreme cases, let's say that F2 was 1,100, so y you can still ask yourself, given the distribution, what is more likely, that F, uh, that F2 is higher above the diagonal or F2 is lower uh, below the diagonal. You can still get better than chance level just by knowing F2 and the distribution. And in, in the general case that you did not completely forget F1 but only have some degraded representation of it, we can still solve this or the, the observer can still solve this using the um, Bayesian inference. What, what basically what the subject is trying to do is answer the question of um, well, what is the probability that F1 is, higher, is larger than F2 given I1 and I2, I1 and I2 are the, the internal representation, I1 is the internal representation of F1 and I2 is the internal representation of F2. And we can, uh, we can solve this. In order to solve this, we have to know two things. The, the, the subject or the observer has to know two things. One of them is this uh, term over here. That's uh, how our internal representations distributed given the true values. Ba that's basically the noise. But basically, uh, um, and and um, given that subjects have a lot of experience with their own sensory systems, it, it, it makes sense to assume that they have a pretty good representation of, of uh, how this term should behave. And the, the other term that they should have is the prior distribution, right? As, as in my example, if you know the prior distribution, then you, you can use it um, to, solve this, um, <coughs> to solve this question. And in our experiment, it's not really clear how subjects have this prior. We'll talk about that in a minute. But assuming they, ha they have access to bo both of these terms, then th they can pretty much solve this problem optimally. And <coughs> If, if we assume that the, the distribution of, uh, of tones in the experiment is, 
let's say, Gaussian and independent, then the solution is pretty simple. It basically says, okay, you want to know which one was higher, F1 or F2, given your internal presentations, I1 or I2, what you have to do is compare your internal presentation of F2, instead of comparing to F1, you have to compare it, or to, to I1, your internal presentation of it, what you have to do is you have to compare it to some weighted average of, the, of your representation of the first tone and the mean of the prior distribution. Um, now, let, let's see how this uh, simple algorithm explains the, the pattern that we see in the data. Okay, so um, let's, let, let's start by uh, examining a trial from this region. So we have two tones. Both of them are higher than the average tone, but the first one is, uh, is slightly lower. Okay, the second one is higher because we are above the diagonal. Now, in, instead of, again, the algorithm says, instead of comparing your representation of the, of the first to the second, make some average of the first tone and the, and the, tot and the overall average of the stimuli. So in, in this case, it's 1,000. So you, uh, in, in our terminology, you contract the first tone towards the mean, and then you make the comparison. Now, you effectively increased the, the, the distance between the two tones. So you made the trial easier, and therefore we expect to see a higher correct rate in this region. Now, a trial in this region is, again, both tones are high, but this time the first one is higher. So now when you make this contraction, you actually decrease the, the, the difference between the two tones and make the trial more difficult, and we expect a lower uh, percent correct in this region. And in the low tones, we have, again, if both, both tones are low then, and the first one is higher than the second, then by contracting the, the first tone towards the mean, you increase the difference and then you get the high percent correct here and uh, the opposite in, in this region. And um, we can relax the, the, uh, the assumption of a Gaussian independent prior and, and solve, this, uh, solve this using simulations and we get that the, the Bayesian model that assumes that, pr that uh, subjects know the prior distribution and behave optimally according to it uh, gives us pretty much uh, um, gives us a, a pretty good fit to the data. And w one one important prediction of the Bayesian model is that given then if you have more noise, you should put more weight on the prior distribution. Okay, that, that's one Im very important uh, prediction of the model. And uh, this is uh, a ver verification of this uh, prediction from uh, um, a, a different experiment in monkeys, but using a very similar design to what I presented uh, previously, but this, this is in monkeys and using vibrotectile um, discrimination. So the monkey has to, to, to uh, respond which, which of two vibrations on the fingertip was, uh, uh, had a higher frequency. And what we see is that if there's a three seconds delay between the two uh, stimuli, the, the, we still see the pattern of bias plus versus bias minus. Performance is better in this region versus this region and in this region compared to this region. And if we increase the delay to six seconds, then the, the, the biases increase significantly from about 10% here to about 25% on average uh, in, in the six seconds uh, condition. So again, this, this prediction of the Bayesian model is ver verified in, in, in other data sets as well. Um, and now I want to turn back to, to the question of how do subjects know the prior? Again, in, in there may be a situation in which it's reasonable to assume that they learn it over their lifetime, but in our experiment, the distribution is unfamiliar to the subjects. It's complete, completely arbitrary, controlled by the experimenter, and they have to somehow estimate it from the data. Uh, so in order to gain some insight into that, th what we did is we tried to model the, the um, responses of the subjects, whether F1 was higher or F2 was higher, as a nonlinear combination of a, of a sum of several terms. Each term is a frequency of the first or the second tone in the current or one of the previous uh, trials. And each of these terms is weighted by um, it, it has some weight, and what we did is we we searched for for the for the weights for the coefficients that make our prediction as close as possible to the data. Okay, and, and these are the, these are the coefficients that are presented in in, in this graph. In, in the green, these are the coefficients of the first uh, of the first stimulus of every trial. This is the current trial 
one trial ago, two trials ago, and three trials ago. And in, in the um, blue, it's the, the coefficients of the second tone of each trial, and this is some global average term. And what we can see here is that the, the last two tone, the, the last two trials have a disproportionately large effect. Now, given that the statistics in our um, in our experiment are stationary, the, it's actually not not really clear why there should be uh, such an effect. So the the, like the optimal thing to do would be to weight all the trials equally because the the like one trial ago does not carry more information about the current trial than 15 trials ago or three trials ago. Um, so, but, but we see that, that subjects have some short time scale of integrating information. And that starts to suggest that maybe they're not really estimating the full prior distribution, but only extracting some important statistics out of it. So, and that leads us to the next question of, do they really perform the Bayesian computation, or is it some approximation of it? For example, Maybe they just contract to the mean, as, and, and, as I've presented, th that's, the, that's the optimal solution for some specific distribution. If uh, Gaussian independent, that's the solution, but for other distributions it, it may not, and the solution may be different, but maybe subjects still perform the same, um, the same algorithm, or the same heuristics. So what we did next is we designed an experiment to test this. Um, in, in this experiment, we had two conditions. In one condition, we oversampled the regions in which uh, the bias imp improves performance, the bias plus regions, and we call this bias plus condition. And in the other condition, we oversampled uh, the bias minus regions. And what we see is that we get the bias in, in both of these conditions. So um, as expected, performance in the bias plus condition was, um, uh, was much better than in, in, the, uh, in the previous experiment. But, and, and importantly, the performance in the bias minus condition was worse. So the, to, to the very least, if subjects had uh, um, a notion of, of the full prior distribution, they could have known that this strategy is, is harmful, is, uh, it degrades their performance. Uh, at least they could have turned, it, turned off this strategy. They could have actually done something better and even, even improved because an, any um, interesting statistics ca can be exploited. But we see that they don't do that. So it seems that subjects use maybe this hard-coded contraction to the mean um, heuristic, at least given the, the, the time, the, the amount of exposure that they had in this experiment. So uh, we, we've seen like two, two approaches. One of them is classical signal detection theory that assumes that every trial is performed out of context. It, does it is not affected by previous trials. And we've seen that th this doesn't really uh, predict the behavior in this experiment. And um, w we talked about the Bayesian model that assumes that a full prior is known, and it also doesn't fully capture what's going on here. So we, we suggest what we view as a minimal modification of the classical model in the direction of the, of the Bayesian model. Uh, we call it the implicit memory model, and it's, um, it's fairly simple. It assumes that subjects have um, like a, a single scalar that represents, the, 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 that is a memory trace, they initialize it in the first trial to just the, the, the observation, the, the, first, uh, the first tone plus its uh, noise, so the first observation. And then on, on uh, subsequent trials, they update it using some weight, eta times the previous memory trace and one minus eta times the, the new observation. That, uh, just update it online. And when they have to make a decision, instead of comparing uh, F1 to, to F2, they compare the memory trace to F2 Again, a simplifying assumption, we assume that F2 has a noiseless representation. So otherwise, that would have to be I2. Um, so th this is a two-parameter model. So every subject is char characterized by eta. That's the, the learning rate, or one minus, minus eta is actually the learning rate, how, how much weight is assigned to new observations, or eta is the, the time scale of the memory. And sigma, which is not explicitly written here, but that's the, the standard deviation of this noise. So what, what we did is we fit these parameters to the data in the bias plus uh, condition, and then we simulated the new data set using the, the uh, model observers, and we get uh, more or less the same performance. And then without changing the parameters, we simulate the, the same model observers in the bias minus condition, and we get a, a very good fit to the, uh, the amount of degradation in performance just because of the change of the distribution. 
and we went back to the experiment to the first experiment and we also see that uh, the, the general pattern of performance is, is, <coughs> is also replicated by this simple model. Um, so to summarize what I've said until now, we, um, I hope I've convinced you that prior knowledge plays a large role in perception and these high level effects uh, are even seen in, in very simple perceptual tests, maybe the simplest you could think of. Um, and we can think of the contraction bias as a as an optimal strategy, a Bayesian optimal strategy that is that has some approximate implementation. It's, it's approximate in at least two senses. One, it uses a short time scale, and, and uh, I'm a psychologist, so when I say short time scale, I don't mean uh, 100 milliseconds. I mean uh, ten, uh, on the order of 10 seconds, but again, in our experiment, the optimal time scale should have been 10 minutes. Um, and and uh, the, the other one is that they use this strategy of contraction to the mean even when the distribution is actually more complex and the, the contraction to the mean is suboptimal, it degrades uh, performance. And we, we've uh, presented a simple two-parameter model for this, uh, um, for this behavior that Sagi is going to build on to gain some insight into um, to what happens in dyslexia. And now I have uh, just enough time to talk about, uh, to talk a bit about my more recent work. That's, um, Maybe questioning, actually questioning this point. I, is it really um, an approximation of a Bayesian, uh, of a Bayesian strategy? So, but both in, in my work, but also in many others, uh, there's been uh, plenty of papers in the last um, 10, 15 years or so claiming that oh, uh, this behavior is Bayesian and that behavior is Bayesian and, and so on. And, uh, like the, the 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 proof or the the um, supporting evidence for that claim is usually very close to what I've presented. <laughs> uh, it, it's usually very close to what I've presented. So we show that the behavior can be seen as biased towards more likely stimuli, and the the, 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 the holy grail of of uh, the Bayesian predictions that. The more noise you have, the, the more you rely on the prior information. Now, um, I, I started because of a talk given in the El ELSEC seminar uh, quite a while ago by Omri Barak, I started playing with the recurrent networks. And, and, and it, it, uh, it, it turned out that, that his networks uh, show that, uh, not his, but uh, uh, I, I was introduced to the concept by him, but. Uh, so these recurrent networks also show these biases. And after, after uh, um, some uh, remark by Chaim, I, I was uh, motivated to test. And uh, actually, it turns out that even a simple perceptron uh, uh, shows these behaviors. So, the, so the, th these are the results of a simple perceptron performing this task using a perceptron learning rule. So the, the first thing that you, you teach in, in the first lesson of um, machine learning or whatever. And it, it shows a contraction bias, but but can you think of a perceptron as a, an a, a approximation of a Bayesian strategy? So I, I, at least in, I, you can, you can, <laughs> yeah, I, you can. I, I think it's better not to because th there's at least one important distinction between what most people think of Bayes as and a perceptron. So the Bayesian algorithm is unsupervised. It learns the distribution. It, uh, for example, it shouldn't care about the feedback that it gets. Now, a perceptron doesn't learn the distribution. It learns, it has some uh, or, or supervised learning models in, in, in general. They have a mapping from, uh, from stimuli to responses, and they update this mapping using the feedback that they get. So th 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 there is an important distinction, distinction and th this uh, distinction becomes even more important if you take these ideas seriously and then go to... An, uh, electrophysiological experiments trying to look for the, for the substrate of, of these mechanisms. So I if you're looking for a Bayesian or an unsupervised learning <coughs> algorithm, you should be looking for one thing. And if you're looking for a perceptron or, or a supervised learning algorithm, you should be looking for something completely different. And now I'm not saying that, that I have very good evidence that the behavior that I've shown uh, previously is performed by, or the, the, the mind Im implements it, the brain implements it as a perceptron, just saying that this option has has been overlooked, at least uh, um, 
I think so. So um, thank you very much. And, uh, we have time for several questions. Okay, uh, so the, the, here this the, this uh, graph shows that the perceptron fits the amount of bias that it has to the amount of noise that it has. So basically, eta is optimal compared to sigma, but that's given that the distribution is a distribution that uh, the perceptron can optimally perform on. For example, the perceptron cannot implement a nonlinear uh, separator, right? Because it's it's, it's uh, that that's. The only thing that it can um, represent. So the perceptron would be suboptimal, for example, in, in a bimodal <coughs> distribution. And, and the minus condition is, is at this nature? Um, no, no. So, uh, so for example, th th that's why I'm, I'm saying I'm, I'm not really advocating for the perceptron model per se. I'm just giving it as an example of a supervised learning algorithm. You're right. The perceptron um, w would be better in the bias minus condition yeah. com compared to the balanced com condition, exactly. So, and, and we see that subjects are not. So, okay, they are not perceptrons. But, uh, the, it was just an example of a supervised learning algorithm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm still trying to understand your point about the recurrent networks. I mean, I, I guess I probably don't understand how you were training the recurrent network. If, if you were training the recurrent network to do a two-tone frequency You are rewarding it for you are rewarding it. That, that's the right thing to do, right? So uh, the, the 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 Bayesian solution tells us w what you should do if you have all the statistical information about the world, uh, every statistical um, parameter that you want. So th th that's the best thing you can do. So in a way, to perform the task well, you have to perform close to the Bayesian optimal solution. So e even though I am not um, explicitly rewarding it for remembering the past, that's the right thing to do because it has, the, the, so the, the, the network gets a, a, an input that represents F1, then some interstimulus interval, then uh, uh, an input that represents F2. So uh, the network, just like our subjects, at the moment of decision has a degraded representation of F1 compared to F2. So it, 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 it's, it basically boils down to, to the same reason why the perceptron does it. Okay, and, and in the perceptron, I just added some noise to the presentation, to the unit that represents F1, and I rewarded it just for correct responses. That's everything that I did. So again, if you have a very, very large noise, in a sense, let, let's say that your presentation of, of F1 is, is, has zero information, then Again, the right thing to do, just in li like in the extreme example that I gave, is, is uh, compare F2 to the mean of the distribution. <coughs> I don't have to explicitly encode it in the experiment. Okay, any other questions? If not, we'll move on to the next talk. So in the next few minutes, I will try to convince you that, of, that the model that Ofri has just presented is useful to understand a thing or two in, um, in dyslexia. Uh, this work was done in Rav Achisar's lab with, uh, um, collabor in collaboration with uh, Professor Jonathan Levenstein. So uh, what do we commonly know about dyslexia? It is a widespread uh, learning disability. Dyslexics read slower and less accurate than adequate readers, and um, you might you might you might be familiarized with the uh, um, the overall finding that in tasks that require working memory loads, uh, dyslexics uh, tend to perform poorer than uh, adequate readers. 
Also, it is it is widely accepted already that that dyslexics have a lower performance in perceptual discrimination tasks, such as the frequency discrimination task, which Ofri has uh, demonstrated. In this task, dyslexics require a larger uh, difference between the two tones in order to achieve the same level of success. This uh, finding has been replicated more than a dozen times already, which uh, gave some support to the perhaps uh, most uh, widely accepted theory of dyslexia, the phonological deficit theory. This theory posits, posits that, that um, dyslexics have some deficit in uh, their auditory, um, auditory domain, which in turn leads to a phonological deficit. Anyone can read this? That's, that's a, if, if you can read it, you're a linguistic. Um, which in turn leads to a uh, to, to reading difficulty since we, uh, we 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 read letters, turn them into uh, sounds and then into meanings. On the other hand, the anchoring deficit theory, which was proposed by uh, by Mirav, claims that there is a pivotal difference between the reference containing condition that is a a stimuli protocol in which one stimuli, one stimulus is repeating from trial to trial compared to a no reference protocol in which the two stimuli are drawn from a wide distribution. This is the protocol that Ofri has presented in, in the last talk, but this protocol, the reference protocol, is the protocol that is mostly wide, that is that, that mostly is used in psychophysics. So Perhaps the difference that we that, that we just saw between dyslexics and controls uh, arise from from this um, from this from the use of of this protocol. And indeed, when um, controls and dyslexics uh, are measured in this protocol, we see the same uh, difference as was replicated already. And when we measure them um, in the no reference condition, we uh, we don't see any significant difference between the, between the two groups. Is that so? So let's use this, use of freeze model to better investigate the uh, behavior of, of control participants and dyslexic participants in this no reference protocol. The question we want to know is, is whether in this protocol dyslexics um, utilize uh, the prior knowledge or the um, or, or statistics in a different way than uh, than control participants, and whether this can tell us anything about the core deficit in dyslexia. We recruited a group of dyslexics and controls. Um, we matched them uh, for age, gender, and general reasoning skill to rule out other uh, possible explanations. We verified uh, their reading impairment and adequacy in our lab. We didn't trust any other uh, um, external diagnosis. Among controls, we replicated the, find, the, the basic finding that Ofri has presented. Uh, that is that in the bias plus region, they perform much, much better than in the bias minus region. Each dot here represents a trial. And the, the color of each dot represents the, uh, the cross-subject accuracy in this trial. So all subjects in, our, in this experiment received the same set of stimuli, and the accuracy is across subjects in this case. What do you think would be the pattern, the pattern of, uh, of uh, performance among dyslexics? Well, their bias is much weaker. They tend to do better in the bias plus region than in the bias minus region. But the difference between performance in bias plus and bias minus is much smaller than, in, than among controls. We um, infer that their statistic utilization is impaired. Next, what we want to do is to use Ofri's, Ofri's heuristical model, the model which, which only has two parameters, the online learner uh, of prior model, or the implicit memory model. And we want to estimate the two parameters among our uh, participants. That is, we want to estimate their internal level of 
um, representational noise, sigma, and the amount of weight that they give prior knowledge that is eta. According to the Bayesian approach, which Ofri has nicely um, explained, we expect that uh, individuals with higher within trial noise, that is higher sigma, would also have higher impact of previous trials, that is higher eta. In Bayesian terminology, the prior here is the weighted average of all previous stimuli, and the observation is the um, noisy, um, observa noisy, um, a noisy representation of this of the first tone in this in the current trial. Higher eta. We expect them to rely more on previous trials. So, eta, eta here is the weight that we give okay. previous trials. Okay, it's one over eta the other way. Um, following Chaim's remark from the last time I gave this talk, we uh, managed to <laughs> we managed to calculate the. Um, optimal eta given any value of, uh, of sigma. What you see here is the, uh, in the green line. Uh, so, um, well, it's not surprising, but as I said before, um, the larger sigma, the, the higher eta you need in order to reach the optimal performance or the best success rate in, in any, um, in, the, in, this, in the stimuli set, in the stimuli sequence. We also built a confidence interval around this uh, optimal eta, and we estimated our control subjects to be almost all of them within this confidence interval around the optimal value of, uh, of, of memory weight. In contrast, most of our dyslexic participants are outside or even below this uh, confidence interval, meaning um, and when we, when we measure for each subject the inoptimality index or the uh, difference between the optimal eta that he should have had and the estimated eta that we estimated, um, we find that, uh, that the, this inoptimality is significantly larger than, uh, in dyslexics than in controls. We infer that controls adequately compensate uh, their representational noise with higher prior gain, and that dyslexics underweigh this prior against their um, current noise. Another question, something a little bit different, is where this prior formed? Um, is this uh, related, is it, is it has to do with the task we're performing, or is it automatic? Is it, uh, in a, is, it formed, is this prior formed in some um, modality-specific uh, cortical region, or is it multimodal? To answer these questions, we, well, to try and answer these questions, we used passive measurement of, uh, of ERP during um, uh, administration of the, same of the same stimuli. So our, our participants heard the same set of stimuli while they watched a silent movie, so we could record uh, their ERP more quietly, let's say. What do we expect? We expect from previous literature that uh, to find the N1P2 complex, which will follow any uh, auditory stimulus, and we expect that the P2 will be sensitive to the statistics, to the, the amplitude of P2 will be sensitive to the statistics of the, ex of the experiment. So what they found here what the, what the researchers found here is that uh, P2 is augmented in response to familiar stimuli with time compared to unfamiliar stimuli. But So what do we find? We found that um, indeed for every tone depicted here in black rectangle we can observe the uh, most prominent N1P2 complex. So what you see here is the response to the bias plus trials. And when we compare them to the response with the response to the bias minus trials, we see a difference in the P2. That is, in bias plus trials, P2 reflects some uh, familiarity to 
F1, while bias minus bias minus in bias minus trials, P2 here reflects some maybe perhaps uh, uh, distance from familiarity. Just to remind you that in bias plus trials, the first tone is indeed closer to the mean frequency of all previous trials compared to the second tone. And when in bias minus trials, the first tone is farther away from the mean frequency, thus maybe less, uh, less familiar when, uh, when our auditory system is required to respond to. This difference might be small, but it is uh, uh, significant across our subjects. So most of our subjects had a larger bias plus P2 area than bias minus P2 area. This difference is not apparent uh, in, our control, in our dyslexics participants. Oops, something is stuck here. OK. So most of our uh, dyslexic participants are along the diagonal, and there is no difference in the grand average uh, ERP between bias plus trials and bias minus trials. We uh, conclude this part by saying that um, the automatic incorporation of the prior is not uh, task dependent, rather it's, it is automatic. The formation might be uh, modality specific since P2 is elicited in early auditory cortex. And this automatic prior incorporation is impaired in dyslexia. So another question we can ask is what source of information do, this, do we use in order to build this, uh, this prior. So another, uh, another possible explanation um, other than this heuristical model is that we actually use only the last tone, the, la the, the, the first tone of the last trial in order to, uh, to, to have some information about, uh, in order to have some information to which to contract this uh, first tone of the current trial. Another option is that we might have some global estimation or uh, overall estimation of the mean frequency. Unfortunately, these two effects, the global effects and the local effects, are highly correlated and thus inseparable in, with, in, when we just randomly draw trials one after the other. So we had to construct a specific sequence of trials in which the global, effects, uh, the global effect and the local effect are decorrelated or uncorrelated, while keeping the, the, the basic properties of the uh, stimuli as natural as possible, so subjects won't um, won't be drawn, their their attention won't be drawn to uh, to to other other things. These properties are, for example, uniform F1 F2 distribution, no random walk behavior of F1 or F2, and no uh, correlation between the bias magnitude and the difficulty level. After, uh, it, took, it took us some time, but we managed to construct such a, such a sequence. And we administered it to, um, to another group, this time a larger group of dyslexics and controls, matched them again for uh, age, gender, and general reasoning skill. Again, we had to verify the reading impairment and adequacy. When we look at the distributions of, of, of F1 and F2 with respect to the global bias, that is with respect to the, to the mean frequency, we replicate this, the basic finding that is among controls, the uh, difference between bias plus and bias minus uh, trials is larger than among the dyslexics and the difference between, and the interaction between uh, the groups is, um, is indeed significant. With respect to the local bias, this time the axes here <coughs> are not the actual frequency, but the, but the frequency, uh, or the, the, actually the log of the frequency minus the log of the, of the, of the previous uh, frequency of F1, of, of, of the first tone. This time uh, we see that in, with respect to the local bias, the difference between bias plus trials and bias minus trials is roughly similar w between the two groups, and the interaction is not significant between the groups. 
This is not enough to show uh, a sig significance in one condition and uh, insignificant in another condition. So we used a general linear model to predict the response of, of each individual participant in each uh, uh, trial. This, we used um, the actual difference between the two tones in the current trial as one predictor, the global effect, the global bias as a second predictor, and uh, local bias as a third predictor. We didn't find any significant difference in the response uh, of, 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 this, of, this, uh, of these participants in, in their response to the, um, to the delta F predictor, that is the difference between F2 and F1 in the current trial. But we did find a significant difference um, in, the, um, in, the, in the prediction of the, of the global bias to the response of, of our uh, individual participants. And we didn't find any difference um, between the prediction that the local bias gives us to predict the, um, the individual response of our participants. And this time, we can also con um, construct an Oh, we can also test an interaction between bias effect and group, and this time we, we found the, um, the, this interaction significant. So, to wrap it all together, um, we learned, I think we learned something about dyslexia, that their automatic um, use of utilization of global context is uh, impaired. So we, um, we demonstrate why it is automatic and why it is global. Um, this, leaves their, um, this, leaves, this leaves our dyslexics uh, participants or dyslexics in general with less information to compensate for noisy observations. And it seems like their bias towards <coughs> recent stimuli uh, is, uh, is still intact. <clears throat> so why why does why is it important for um, for us when we read to um, to compensate noisy observation with prior knowledge, and why what does it have to do with uh, dyslexia? So reading is a very demanding sensory task. It is uh, it places a, a very high bur very large burden on our sensory um, well, sensory systems. Which we might be, uh, <clears throat> which we actually we have to compensate with prior knowledge. Prior knowledge in language is vast. I mean, it is semantics. It, it includes semantics, syntax, morphology, and orthography. It, we we use so much prior knowledge about orthography, for example, that most of you didn't notice the uh, letter switch in this uh, in this word, and it really didn't bother you to continue and read this sentence, if you if you're reading this sentence. Um, we, we found in another, in another uh, study in our lab, we did find that uh, the, the, the morphological regularity utilization is impaired in uh, dyslexia. And if you want, uh, Eva Kimmel, I guess, would, lo would love to uh, elaborate on this during lunch, maybe. Um, yeah, I'll skip this. And I want to, lastly, I want to, I want to uh, thank uh, my advisor, Professor um, Merav Chisar, Professor Jonathan Levenstein for collaborating me, with me in, in this work, Ofri Raviv, who helped me um, to implement his model to, uh, with, with uh, our data, and uh, all our lab members throughout the years who helped me um, along the way, and uh, students and research, research assistant that uh, also helped me in gathering the information the, the data and um, give some advice here and there. Thank you. We have time for some questions. So I was wondering, you uh, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned this as a problem in uh, statistics, basically, and. But wouldn't you say that it's more a problem of sort of memory more than the, the so I'm wondering if you yeah. are to increase the time period between trial and trial, does that get worse? I mean the statistics are exactly the same, but now you have a 
you must have read my research proposal. Um, no, that's to, that's exactly I have, I that's exactly what we what we what we're thinking of doing next. Uh, we assume, yeah, it's not about uh, um, statistics. Statistics matters only in this particular uh, context. It is a matter of how much we can retain a memory along a longer time period. Yes, please. Um, if you would relate the, the, uh, the problem of, of, uh, of uh, uh, reading language to something like uh, something like kind of the existence of priors, wouldn't you expect a difference between different languages that have more of the yeah. uh, more, more of the structure of the world uh, kind of coded in a, in a sensory way versus uh, languages like, uh, like Hebrew, where a lot of the, a lot of the structure is, is, is essentially in your memory, and some some words uh, look the same, but depend mm -hmm. on, on the context and the previous memories too. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, there is. I mean, the literature about uh, how dyslexics perform in transparent language versus op like such as I don't know uh, Spanish. Or <coughs> as compared to to opaque language such as Hebrew, is is vast. I mean, there is a huge literature about that, and mostly we see other phenomena. I mean, there are dyslexics in in w w I with uh, transparent languages as well, but they behave somewhat differently. Um, I still. Uh, dyslexics tend to read. Uh, maybe maybe this last presentation was important. Maybe this last slide was important. Dyslexics are much more susceptible to the word to the length of the word <coughs> they read. Okay, so that that implies us that they read letter by letter. So even in in uh, transparent languages, they s they will still read slower than um, than adequate readers because adequate readers <coughs> just read the, the the word as a whole. Okay, so in 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 non-transparent languages such as Hebrew, they might do more errors. Okay, but they but they st will still read slow. But they still they will read slower in both types of languages. Anyone else? No. If, if you design a version of your task in the visual domain or semantosensory domain, but exactly the same structure, and what people were looking at is just for a variation in contrast <coughs> with a Gabor filter or a variation in frequency of a somatosensory stimulus, do you, do dyslexic have the same problem with priors? Yes. In, in all sensory modalities? Yes. I mean, the, the basic finding of, um, of the difference between a reference condition, a reference containing condition and a non reference condition uh, containing condition is uh, replicated in, vi in the visual domain as well. Actually, it was replicated in our lab already. Um, I think. Actually, it was done before the auditory, right? Before the auditory stuff, <coughs> or during. Uh, it's too, it's too far, have, anyway. But vision and uh, addition both have to do with language comprehension, right? And yeah. he's asking, well, what if you are to do this in a tactile task or, or in uh, olfactory task? Is this something that's generalized across any sensory domain? And I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, uh, we, we, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with any uh, Weber tactile uh, study with dyslexic, so I don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next talk is by Professor uh, Richard Axel, the final talk of this. Uh, okay. Thank you. It's um, a real pleasure to have the opportunity to listen um, and speak today. Um, I do love this country. Um, and as I listened uh, this morning, what was striking to a visitor is the deep ra rabbinic uh, sense of uh, the scientists here. Not just any rabbi, but uh, a gadol bat Torah. And this reminds me of um, an experience I had on Monday in uh, yeshiva uh, in the old city. I walked into the library of a yeshiva, and there were three rabbis. And they were discussing the concept of the good. And one rabbi said, to me, the good is represented by the Sabbath. It's a day in which we celebrate the work of the Lord in the creation of the universe. It's a day in which we rest and we spend time with our family. 
the second rabbi interrupted, and he said, no, to me the good comes only once a year, on the Passover, when we celebrate the emergence of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, and the travails of the desert, and the entry into the promised land. And it too is a day when we celebrate the Lord with our family. And the third rabbi said, no. To me, the good is when you meet a beautiful woman and you take her to a lot <laughs> and you rip off all of her clothes and you make passionate love until spent. And at this point, the first two rabbis interrupt and said, no, no, rabbi. We are discussing the good and you are discussing the very good. <laughs> this is not a nose. It's a portrayal by the Belgian surrealist René Magritte of his own brain's representation of the external world. It is a vignette of image and reality locked in mutual cancellation. And this conflict between the physical <coughs> representation of an object in the world and the way that object is represented in the brain, as we have heard, is not only the basis of creativity in art, but is at the very essence of psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience. And what I would like to discuss uh, this morning is how it is that olfactory uh, information, how it is that chemical structures can be repre uh, represented and discriminated in the brain. Now, all organisms have evolved a mechanism to recognize olfactory information in the brain, uh, in the world and transmit this information to the brain where it then must be processed to create an internal representation of chemical structures in the world. This internal representation must then translate stimulus features into meaningful behavioral output. And it's important to recall that behavioral out output comes in two forms, innate and learn. What I'd like to describe today are two neural circuits that um, mediate innate and learned behavior. Moreover, I will describe these two neural circuits in two different organisms, in the mouse and the fly, and reveal a rather striking similarity in both the anatomy and functional logic of the two systems, despite the 600 million years of evolution that separate the two organisms. And finally, um, what we learn is that this philosophic controversy between the innate and the learned, between nature and nurture, is really um, uh, obliterated by these observations in the sense that both innate and learned behavior appear to share a neural architecture. There is indeed an, an intimate relationship between the pathways mediating innate and learned behavior. So let's consider <coughs> the olfactory system of the mouse. In the mouse, what we see here is the olfactory epithelium, which has been genetically manipulated so that individual neurons expressing a given receptor are green. Within the olfactory epithelium, individual neurons choose one of over a thousand receptors. Neurons expressing a given receptor are randomly distributed within zones of the epithelium, but order is restored 
as, as we follow the processes of these neurons into the first relay station in the brain, the, the olfactory bulb. And here you see, how do I make this work? Uh, here you see the convergence of axons from the, these neurons that express one of the thousand receptors. It immediately follows that neurons making different receptors will project to different loci. These loci are called glomeruli. And importantly, the relative position of these glomeruli in space in the olfactory bulb are conserved in all individuals in a species. It immediately follows then that a given odor will activate a combination of receptors, which in turn will result in the activation of a, um, of a stereotyped spatial map of neural activity. And imaging studies initially performed by the late Larry Katz, a number of laboratories, including our own, indeed provide functional um, support for this anatomic picture. Here you see in green um, a glomerulus, a locus of convergence that is activated by a component of fox urine leading to avoidance behavior, and here banana. And these patterns of neural activity are stereotyped from individual to individual, and an experienced observer with a two-photon microscope can look down on the olfactory bulb and discern with reasonable uh, confidence the nature of the odor that the organism is, has encountered in the world simply by virtue of uh, spatial patterns of neural activity. But the mouse brain does not have a two-photon microscope in it. And so we have to ask how it is that the mouse is able to interpret these spatial patterns of neural activity. And to do this, what we do is we trace the information from individual glomeruli to higher <coughs> olfactory centers. Now, the projection neurons that carry this information from an individual glomerulus to higher olfactory centers, the mitral cell has a unique property in that it, it, its dendrites are dedicated to one of the thousand glomeruli in the olfactory bulb. So we can follow the information flowing from a singular glomerulus in the bulb to higher olfactory centers. And what we observe when we do this, and this is the projection pattern of only 15 projection neurons that run from a single glomerulus. And what we observe is that the information pentafricates. Uh, it, uh, a given mitral cell projects to five loci. And I wish to focus on two of the sites of projection, two major sites of projection um, uh, uh, of information from the bulb, the piriform cortex and the cortical amygdala. What we can immediately see is that a given glomerulus projects to piriform cortex in a highly distributive fashion. In other words, this highly ordered glomerular map that um, we observe appears to be discarded anatomically in the piriform cortex. And every glomerulus exhibits exactly the same pattern, distributive pattern of projections. This is in contrast to the projections to cortical amygdala, where each glomerulus appears to deliver uh, a more diffuse, but nonetheless anatomically stereotyped pattern of projections unique to each glomerulus that appears to be conserved in all individuals. And so the um, observation that cortical amygdala 
retains but transforms the topographic map of the olfactory bulb is consistent with the notion that the cortical amygdala is engaged in innate behavior. Innate behavior is observed in all individuals in a species without prior learning or experience, suggesting that indeed it is mediated by evolutionarily determined, stereotyped uh, neural pathways. Whereas this loss of order in the piriform cortex will afford, as we will see, an individual to recognize the universe of molecular structures that we define uh, as odors, but might be more suited to accommodate learned uh, olfactory behavior. And so we set out to test this suggestion. Uh, we is um, uh, a fellow in the laboratory, Corey Root. I'm going to um, uh, mention a number of student and postdoc names because I do nothing. It's written in the Tanakh that the work of the righteous is done by others. <laughs> um, are you aware of this, Chaim? Yes, I think you are. Um, it, in the Talmud. Yes, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, okay, and so uh, Corey did uh, a relatively uh, simple experiment in which um, he simply introduced into virtually all of the projection neurons in the olfactory bulb um, a genetically encoded chloride pump, halorhodopsin, which is light activated, and simply walked along um, the uh, projection sites in higher olfactory centers and asked which of the sites, if input from the bulb is inhibited, would eliminate innate olfactory behavior. So he worked out a nice four-field assay, which we will not discuss. Data is frowned upon, I've noticed. Um, and um, uh, what he observed quite strikingly <coughs> is that if you give an animal um, this component of fox urine, they exhibit very striking avoidance behavior. But if you silence the inputs to cortical amygdala, that avoidance behavior is elimina eliminated. And we can demonstrate this for a number of different aversive odors, as well as a host of appetitive uh, odors, some of which uh, signal food. So it seems from this experiment that, um, that the cortical amygdala is necessary to elicit innate avoidance behavior. What about um, causality? What about sufficiency? And for this, we developed a, um, uh, uh, some molecular chicanery, which might provide uh, Bill with the opportunity to test his um, thinking. Um, and that is, um, we devised a way to express either Halorhodopsin, a silencer, or channel rhodopsin, a light activated um, cation channel, only in those cells activated by a sensory stimulus. And so um, we give an odor, we decorate neurons responsive to that odor, and then we expose those neurons to light and we ask. Do we see a behavior that now recapitulates the behavior we observe with that odor? And indeed, when you do that experiment, uh, in the absence of odor, there is no channel expression. When the, organ when the mouse is exposed to odor, we see expression in a spatially segregated array of neurons. And when we expose these animals to light, after we have, after exposure to an aversive odor, 
in which we've decorated the neurons responsive to an aversive odor, we in fact see robust avoidance. When we do the same experiment with an odor that leads to an appetitive response, we indeed see an appetitive response, and that's summarized here. So these experiments demonstrate causality. And so what we have demonstrated is that the cortical amygdala is both necessary and sufficient to mediate innate um, olfactory behaviors, and we do not know the full range of behaviors mediated by cortical amygdala. What we also observed is that the neurons, re can you hear me? That the neurons responsible for aversive behavior are spatially segregated and distinct from a more elusive population of neurons responsive to uh, um, appetitive cues. And so we could play additional chicanerous games where um, what we are able to do is simply introduce channel rhodopsin into the 250 micron anterior most element of the cortical amygdala and ask whether the introduction um, uh, or the activation of anterior cortical amygdala leads to <coughs> aversive behavior, and it de indeed it does. If we introduce channel into the um, more posterior regions of the cortical amygdala, we um, uh, observe no aversive behavior. Um, and so these experiments, uh, finally, I should point out that preliminary um, uh, imaging experiments uh, using indwelling microscopes from uh, Schnitzer and company appear to indicate that odor discriminability within a locus of neurons eliciting an innate behavior is lost. That is, neurons in the anterior cortical amygdala responsive to one aversive odor, TMT, are also responsive to a second aversive odor. So um, there, there has been uh, a dramatic reduction in dimensionality in this system. Now, innate behavior then, we've shown, can be mediated by cortical amygdala. The cortical amygdala is both necessary and sufficient to elicit innate behavior. What about learned behavior? This is the uh, distributive pattern uh, uh, of projections of neurons from only one of the thousand glomeruli. I repeat that um, all of the glomeruli appear to give the very same distributive pattern. And several years ago, and I'll move through this quickly, Dan Stepler provided uh, functional um, uh, support for the anatomic distribution. Here you see two photon imaging across a broad swath of uh, the piriform cortex. And what you see is the response of neurons <coughs> to four different odors. And you can see that the functional response is indeed distributive as well. And we learn three things from the, this imaging. First, that um, every odor activates from 5 to about 12% of the neurons. Second, that there is no apparent spatial distribution. There is no spatial segregation that mirrors either the structure of the odor or the, um, uh, or the, the quality of the odor or the behavior that the odor elicits in the mouse. <coughs> All odors give this intermingled uh, pattern of neural activity. Second, um, uh, the distribution is uh, third. The distribution is um, sparse. And all of this data taken together with um, 
uh, several additional experiments are most consistent with the fact that an individual piriform neuron receives input from a random collection of about 200 glomeruli. And this is data from our laboratory, from Mike Ehler's laboratory, and um, uh, um, modeling experiments uh, performed by Larry. And I should point out, Larry is a major component uh, of my thinking uh, over the last years. Modeling data by La of our data by La Larry are indeed most consistent with the argument that a given neuron receives input from a random collection of data and a more sophisticated modeling of, uh, by Merov, Stern, and Larry indeed uh, uh, support this notion. And so we have a random distribution um, and we can demonstrate that indeed piriform cortex by silencing experiments, piriform cortex in the mouse is very large. It's seven or eight millimeters. It's the most significant cortical region in the mouse brain. And through Herculean efforts, what we could demonstrate is that silencing piriform cortex eliminates learned behavior to odors, leaving innate behaviors intact. And so we're left then with a distribution of um, neural activity. These neurons are indeed exhibiting a primitive form of mixed selectivity. The, um, a given odor cannot be encoded in the activity of an individual neuron. Each neuron is responsive to 10% of the odors. And the identity of uh, the odor, therefore, must be, must be defined by a population code. If, indeed, the piriform is required for learning, and, indeed, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, representation in piriform reflects the input of a random combina uh, combination of gl glomeruli, the implication is that any given representation, yes? Isn't there a difference in density between the colors? I mean, on the right there are much more red dots, and on the left there are more green dots. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, but this does not, I mean, if you do nearest neighbor analysis across the piriform, we've looked at 300,000 neurons. Um, one sees, I mean, in fact, we have calculated using nearest neighbor analysis what the probability is to find local clusters like this. And it's most consistent with randomness. But your eyes are correct. <laughs> um, um, so um, if indeed um, the activity is the consequence of random in input to an individual piriform cell, while a given representation is maintained in a given organism, the representation of the same odor will differ in different individuals. And as a consequence, that representation can have no meaning, and meaning must be imposed by experience. And so Gloria Choi did a very um, simple experiment published uh, that I will walk through very quickly to ask the question, can meaning be imposed on a truly random population of neurons in piriform? And so what she simply did is when you, uh, to try and, and recapitulate the anatomic and functional picture when one gives odor, she simply uh, devised a, um, a viral in um, infection technique to infect relatively sparse populations of neurons with a virus encoding channel rhodopsin. And if you now expose the animal to light, a naive animal to light, 
you see absolutely no behavior. But if you pair light exposure with either an aversive unconditioned stimulus or an appetitive uh, um, unconditioned stimulus, and then come back with light, you indeed will observe either aversive or appetitive behavior. So a random ensemble of neurons can be entrained to elicit any one of a number of behaviors, including social and sexual behavior. So we can make an animal believe that a random ensemble uh, of neurons indeed predicts the appearance of a female. And the male will elicit appropriate social and sexual behaviors. So a given ensemble of neurons in piriform, if activated, elicits no behavior, but can be entrained to elicit an array of learned behaviors. And this allowed us then, this allowed us then to move downstream <laughs> and begin to ask the question, where is it? Which of the outputs of piriform cortex is responsible for eliciting learned behavior? Piriform cortex projects to a very large number of brain loci. Prefrontal cortex back to the olfactory bulb, mouse equivalent of um, cingulate as well as um, the cortical amygdala. And so this allowed us to just uh, follow the path. And so you see some of the outputs of piriform <coughs> cortex here. And we performed an experiment in which we entrained neurons in piriform cortex to elicit a learned appetitive behavior and then simply came in and activated <coughs> the projection from piriform cortex to these multiple loci. And what we observe is that, um, in fact, piriform cortex projections to cortical amygdala appear to be capable of eliciting learned behavior. And so what is happening is that specific projection, direct projections from the olfactory bulb to cortical amygdala can elicit innate olfactory behaviors. These innate behaviors are mediated by topologically segregated loss clusters of neurons. Piriform, which presumably encodes odor identity, sends a strong projection to the neurons encoding innate behavior in cortical amygdala. And at least for learned appetitive behavior, the projections from piriform to <coughs> the cortical amygdala are sufficient to elicit a learned appetitive behavior. So as I said at the outset, um, the neural architecture used to elicit learned behavior mediated by piriform and innate behavior appear to be shared. There's an intimate relation between the two. What is striking is that concurrent investigations, I mean, we, we study the fly because my colleague, uh, Sidney Brenner, once <coughs> said to me that the IQ of a scientist is inversely related to the genome size of the organism he studies. <laughs> um, and so this is a mammal. <laughs> and uh, this is a fly. And what you will see is that the anatomic organization and functional logic of the olfactory system of a fly 
is remarkably similar to what I described for you in the mouse. Despite the vast difference in the complexity of the nervous system, a fly has only 100,000 central neurons. So let's quickly follow the information. And um, the followers uh, are me. Um, uh, this is the way we dress in, in New York. <laughs> we wear ties. And, and this is Larry, who disappeared. What is this? What, so what is this thing? What? Th this is a tie. <laughs> um, and uh, these are uh, women. <laughs> uh, Vanessa Rata and Sophie Caron are responsible for these uh, efforts. Uh, and what we uh, observe, and I should add uh, Leslie Vosshall at earlier um, uh, stages of this effort. So this is the nose of a fly. It's the antenna. And we can do exactly what I described to you in the mouse. Well, um, the fly antenna has 50 uh, neurons, uh, 50 receptors. Individual neurons in the fly antenna express only one of the 50 randomly distributed throughout the nose, throughout the antenna. But if we look in the first relay station of the brain, the antennal lobe, which is anatomically uh, analogous to the olfactory bulb, we find that neurons expressing a given receptor, and this is a, a schematic here uh, put together, neurons expressing a given receptor converge on only one glomerulus. There are 50 glomeruli. Um, these glomeruli, as in the mouse, are stereotyped and identical from individual to, to individual. And a projection neuron then takes the information from <coughs> the, um, <coughs> excuse me, from an individual glomerulus to higher olfactory centers. The projection neuron sends a dendrite <coughs> into only one glomerulus. And in this instance, the projection neuron does not pentafricate, it bifurcates. It bifurcates and projects to two brain regions. One region, the lateral horn. The lateral horn, we and others have demonstrated, is responsible for innate olfactory behavior. And a structure that we'll um, discuss further, the mushroom body which is responsible for learned olfactory behaviors. Yes, flies can learn. Um, <clears throat> and so here we see this uh, more clearly. This is an individual projection neuron from one glomerulus, um, which uh, uh, bifurcates to project to the lateral horn and the mushroom body. And what Vanessa Rutter was able to do was to actually map a pheromone responsive pathway from the nose to the spinal cord, to the ventral nerve cord of the fly. And what we uh, observe is the highly stereotyped nature of this pathway. This is the sensory neuron <coughs> coming into a glomerulus, obscured by the projection neuron, there are only two more neurons, which now bring you um, uh, contralaterally, and one more connection, and you're down into the ventral nerve cord. This pathway is determined and identical in all flies. It, um, it's a pathway responsive to pheromone. As in the mouse, in, if you look, if you image the antenna lobe, you observe that every odor elicits a distinct and stereotyped pattern of neural activity. But now let's consider the um, mushroom body. The mushroom body is a more complex structure. It consists of a calyx. And the calyx 
contains 2,000 intrinsic neurons called um, Kenyan cells. They are the principal neurons of um, the mushroom body, which is the analog of, I would argue, of piriform cortex. First, and I'm going to have to move very fast, um, what we observe in accord with um, the analogy to piriform is that every odor in the calyx of the mushroom body elicits a distributive pattern of neural activity, and this distributive pattern is different from individual to individual, just as I described in the piriform. The second thing we can do in the fly with a precision that's far greater than we can do in the, in the mouse is to ask, are the inputs to Kenyan cells determined or random? I'm not going to go through the technology here, but a given Kenyan cell gets input from, on average, seven glomeruli. And what Sophie and Vanessa were able to do in the laboratory, and um, uh, Larry was an enormous help in evaluating this data, was to generate a connectivity matrix for um, 200 Kenyan cells. And what we could ask is, what is the distribution of glomerular inputs to 200 Kenyan cells? And from that, we observe that a given Kenyan cell receives input from a random collection of glomeruli. If a, if a Kenyan cell receives input from any given glomerulus, that provides no additional information as to the nature of the other inputs. There is no discernible pattern of inputs with respect to the nature of the odor, the anatomy of the system, the behavior that is elicited by any of these glomeruli. Indeed, Kenyan cells receive random input. Now, very quickly, let me move through um, uh, a potential means to address a problem posed by this idea that individual cortical neurons, that individual uh, 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 mushroom body intrinsic neurons receive random input from a combination of glomeruli. For if indeed that is the case, and it appears that way, then we have a disordered representation in high dimension, both in uh, the uh, mushroom body and in piriform cortex. In order for learning to impose meaning on this disordered representation, order must be restored. And in recent experiments, uh, in collaboration largely performed, I should say, by Jerry Rubin's group in Geneva, uh, with which Larry and I and Daisuke Hattori have collaborated, reveal the anatomic and perhaps functional basis for the restoration of order. <laughs> The mushroom body consists of a calyx which contains intrinsic neurons and the dendrites whose glomerular inputs I just described to you. <coughs> the axons of the intrinsic neurons just then project into three lobes. Let's only consider one of those lobes. What Jerry and Daisuke and my lab have been able to do is to identify and generate genetic lines which decorate and allow us to manipulate every neuron in the mushroom body. All of the neurons that are intrinsic to the mushroom body, all of the neurons that project out of the mushroom body, and all of the neurons that project into the mushroom body. Let's first consider, and so this comprehensive set of lines now allows you 
to deduce a function <coughs> neuron. Let's consider the output neurons. There are 2,000 intrinsic neurons. The intrinsic neurons send axons to the lobes, and they um, uh, appear to express en passant synapses at every point along the lobe. There are only 21 classes of output neurons. There are 34 output neurons, 21 classes of output neurons. And the dendrites of the output neurons are segregated in what we have called compartments in the lobe. So you can see that there are two output neurons whose cell bodies are here whose dendrites reside in this compartment in the lobe. A second set of um, what are four output neurons whose dendrites define this compartment in the uh, alpha beta lobe of the mushroom body. And there is this insular high, uh, segregated compartmentalization in the lobes that is created by the, to the topographic restriction imposed upon the dendrites of the individual output neurons. Moreover, in experiments that do not come from my lab, manipulation of these output <coughs> neurons appears to bias behaviors in a re reproducible way. So inhibiting one output neuron appears to elicit aversion in the fly. And another output neuron, appetitive behaviors. And so every Kenyan cell extends axons which synapse, we believe, with every output neuron. But exposure of an odor in a naive fly elicits no behavior. A learning cue must be imposed. Each of these compartments, while receiving dendritic innervation from an output neuron eliciting a behavior, also receives segregated axonal information from an input neuron. And most of the input neurons are dopaminergic. There are only, there are 100 dopaminergic neurons that input into the mushroom body, but there are only 20 different dopaminergic neurons. And each of the different cell dopaminergic cell types projects to one of the compartments. And the segregation of the axons of the dopaminergic neurons follows precisely with the segregation of the dendrites of the output neurons. So, it immediately follows that, indeed, a given compartment receives input um, from all of the Kenyan cells. This information synapses on mushroom body output neurons, which ultimately, we, we believe, elicit behavior. And a learning cue is provided by the restricted axonal innervation of a compartment by a dopaminergic neuron. And in fact, um, it has been demonstrated that the different types of dopaminergic neurons can be activated by different unconditioned stimuli. And so this um, um, anatomy has provided a substrate in which we can now begin to address how it is that a high dimensional random representation in the calyx can in fact be translated into meaningful behavior. And finally, um, I should point out that the output neurons of the mushroom body Many of, many of them project to the lateral horn. The lateral horn, you recall, mediates innate behavior. 
So as in the mouse, the um, uh, uh, direct information to the lateral horn elicits innate behavior, indirect information projecting to the mushroom body subject to um, uh, uh, the presumed uh, learned cues I described to you, then ultimately projects to the lateral horn. And so again, the random representation eliciting learned behavior exploits the determined representation. So what I've described to you is this. And that is what all of you can see here is um, Cy Twombly's uh, very clear representation of Lida and the swan. That is um, uh, Zeus in his failed efforts to seduce the beautiful Leda, turns himself into a swan in an effort to seduce uh, Leda. Um, and this may not be apparent to you. And this, in fact, is the odor representation in piriform cortex, in mushroom body, which is transformed into this rather beautiful figurative uh, representation of Gustave um, Moreau. Here is the beautiful Lida, in this instance, perhaps successfully being seduced by the swan. Thank you. Thank you very much for a magnificent talk. If there is any questions, let's... <coughs> yeah, let's, please. Thank you for this beautiful talk. Uh, do you have any idea how the, so sometimes the automatic innate responses are inhibited or suppressed by the learned responses. In this scheme that you showed, do you have any idea of well? that? Yeah, so that's, that's a very good point. So, in fact, this scheme is well designed to implement that, and we're studying it. So what we've been able to demonstrate is that if we take this component of Fox urine, which uh, trimethylthiazole, which elicits uh, innate avoidance behavior. And we now pair that with reward in a hungry animal. We no longer see aversive behavior. And the fact that piriform, which is responsible for learned behavior, projects into the cortical amygdala, which is mediating the aversive response, provides a very simple circuit to mediate what you're asking for. And we're, we're trying to demonstrate that. Um, so how, how unique is cortical amygdala for innate, for learned behavior? If you activate other targets, or other projection side of the piriform cortex, don't you get learned behavior? No. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. Um, we haven't looked at basal ganglia. I'm, um, uh, what you say is quite important, and uh, this is part of very recent data. Learn appetitive behavior. I cannot elicit by activating pre, uh, prefrontal or um, uh, tuberal. And the learned adversive behavior is using a different pathway. We think we know what it is. We think it is basal lateral amygdala. Yeah, Ben. So you, you've shown that uh, you can uh, use a pathway for, for innate behavior when you when you teach a learned behavior that is innately encoded. But what happens when you teach uh, a learned behavior which is not innately encoded, but just pushing a button or pressing a lever? Yeah, well, um, that's really a good point. That is. What is the, um, um, no, we probably can get, teach a mouse to do that. But you make a good point. Will we use the innate pathway yeah. to elicit uh, a lever press? Probably not. That's going to involve prefrontal. That is, um, we already know from experiments I didn't talk about that when you make the learning task more complex. For instance, we've been able to get mice to do reversal learning. 
which is neat. And reversal learning requires prefrontal cortex, as has been shown for other um, tasks. Yeah. Marshall? In, in the mouse, you've stressed the spatial mapping of odors onto the olfactory bulb and from there to higher centers. But mice, when they sniff um, normal odors or behaviorally relevant ones, they sniff at seven or eight hertz. Mm -hmm. You really have uh, a machine gun pop, pop, yeah. pop, uh, coming down the, the, the olfactory tract onto the cortex. A, a spatial temporal fingerprint, not just a spatial fingerprint. Does the, does the temporal sweep have any relevance here? Yeah, so uh, I should point out, because of what, where piriform cortex is, virtually all of the imaging we've done to date is, um, is done in anesthetized mice. And so this rapid sniffing in response to odor um, is not observed. But you make a good point. I have ignored the temporal dynamics that may play a very significant role in the coding process. Now, other people have not ignored it. And there is an, uh, indeed significant temporal dynamics, as you know, if you add time to space, the coding ability of the system will be enormously <coughs> enhanced. But all efforts to discern um, a temporal component to um, encoding in the piriform, these are experiments by Zach Mainen and um, Reiner Friedrich in the fish, appear um, to argue that um, performance does not seem to engage any temporal component. Well, I'm, I'm wondering about the number of output units, which if I understood correctly, is order 30. If the behavior of the ply would be limited to aversive behavior and repetitive behavior, maybe two neurons would be sufficient. And I'm wondering if think that the number of neurons somehow reflects the dimensionality of the repertoire of the behaviors? I think um, what it reflects is the fact that you do not have individual output neurons that are solely responsible for individual <coughs> behaviors. That, that um, whereas the representation in Kenyan cells is encoding odor identity, you reduce the dimensionality and now the representation of the 21 different output neurons reflects a population curve that elicits a behavior. A given behavior is probably represented by a, um, by a combination of output neurons. There are multiple output neurons that appear to be involved in a version of three, two or three of these. Yes. Uh, so Richard, you said that there is a spatial uh, distinction in the um, cortical amygdala between aversive and repetitive smells. Yeah. Um, do you believe that there is the connections between the peripheral cortex through the uh, cortical amygdala are somehow spatially divided as well? Because when you train a random population, I'm assuming the axons goes everywhere, and yet yeah. you get a very distinct yeah, I, I, behavior. I don't think there is. Um, I, I, I think that piriform projects distributively to all regions of cortical amygdala. But so I haven't nailed it. Yeah, Bill. Richard, you showed us that through molecular chicanery, you can uh, uh, tag all of the cells in the cortical amygdala that are active in response to a particular odor. Mm -hmm. Does that chicanery work in the fearful cortex as well? Um, can you can you tag the cells? So so there's a background in the piriform cortex that is hurting us. Uh, we've not been able to do that experiment. But where we have been able to do it, maybe more 
interesting to you. We can do it. There is an odor representation in prefrontal cortex. This is not, I mean, these cells, as you say, are going to respond to odor and to be context and task dependent. But we can entrain an, ens um, an ensemble. Well, we, we can do the experiment in prefrontal cortex. Okay, so that's, that's one bit. Second bit, can you record the activity of the cells through some GCAP mechanism? Uh, say all the cells in some region of prefrontal or prefrontal cortex. So is it possible to pulse <coughs> stimulate and record the responses of the cells? It, you mean pulse with, pulse with light? Yes, and, pulse then with yes, and then record. Yes, of course. The, the yes. response to the population. Yes. Okay, then if you can do that, you, you can do your experiment to test the dynamics <coughs> and uh, send, you know, uh, uh, put in uh, activation of the illicit uh, particular chemical, say in pure form or free funnel, in a behavioral context where the animal is actually cares cares about that, yeah. and then when he doesn't, yes. and there should be different dynamics observable, and it may even be, you know, as the animal sniffs, you can actually see immigration mm -hmm. in small yeah. amounts of it. Yeah, trying to I, mean, this, I mean this, as, is, as you know, this this is on the edge of doable right yes. now. Uh, okay. And in fact, what we would like to do, I mean, the way to do it is with um, um, optrends in a behaving animal. Okay, I think we should call the session to an end. First thing I know is. Just to end with one point. First thing I notice is that we have our guests here for two days and they're already lost their ties. If we stay, if they keep staying here for a few more days, they'll be in jeans and whatever, like sneakers. Like, yeah. So thank you very much. One more, one more sentence or two sentences for conclusion. Uh, it's uh, basically the thing. So first of all, thank all of you for coming here and sharing with us this day. I would like to thank the member, all the members of the committee. Some of them are here, uh, Richard, Bill, and David, and uh, Larry, and Josh, and Noam. Did I forget anyone? David. Okay. I just said David a minute ago when you talked to him. <laughs> And uh, I would also like uh, to thank uh, two women who worked very hard the whole last month to make this possible, and it is our uh, Alona and Roti. Please. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next year, or actually not so far ahead, in June, in the grand... Uh, uh, Symposium, workshop of ESSEC towards the future. <laughs>